Hey, everyone. Welcome to another great podcast. I'm Melanie Johnson, co-owner of Elite Online Publishing, along with my other co-owner, Jen Foster. Hey, Jen. Hey, everyone. How are you doing today? All right. It's financial day here on our podcast. It's business, finance, money. Yay. So we are really honored to have Patrick Donahue here today. He is the author of Breakout Valuation. And you know what? So many of us are trying to figure out who own a business or want to start a business or even have a side hustle. You know, how do you make your business valuable so you can actually maybe even sell it to someone? How do you, what are the interests, interest, interest I can't even talk today. What are the workings to make it and the building blocks to get it so it really has value at the end of the day and you're just not having a job that you happen to own? So Patrick, welcome today. You're going to solve all of this. I can't wait. Oh yeah, we're just going to figure it all out in a, in 20 minutes here. <laughs> it's great to be with you and to chat about building valuable businesses. Thanks for having me, Melanie and Jen. Well, thanks, Patrick. And Melanie, you need to just say Donahue three times fast. Donahue. 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 I don't know. I just got stuck in there. Too much caffeine or not enough today. Well, there's something about money that gets people tongue twisted. So all of a sudden when people yeah. think about value and building, you know, the money. It, it, it gets... It's been happening to me a lot lately. I got to. <laughs> That's true. Oh, well, tell us, tell us, Patrick, a little bit about your background and how you first decided you were going to own your own business. Well, it's interesting because that story has changed over the last handful of years. And I really realized through writing my book, Breakout Valuation, how I got my start as an entrepreneur. As a young person, you know, we didn't really utilize that that name or that the word entrepreneur at all. And I thought a lot about that. It wasn't until about 15, 20 years ago I started using that term. But, you know, actually I was just looking at it right here, but it probably all started right here when I was four years old selling lemonade with my cousin, Chad. And, you know, like many kids do, you know, starting to sell lemonade. But I think that's really where it really started because as a young person, I was always fascinated with the idea that things had value. And mm -hmm. so sold lemonade and then, you know, did what a lot of kids do where they collect things, whether it's baseball cards or you know, other collectibles and so forth. And that's, I think, really the launching point of what uh, took me into my career in entrepreneurship. <laughs> that's so cool. Well, walk us through, you know, you're, someone's even starting a business. Like we've had ours for eight years. What are some of the things that they should consider and do even when they're starting that they could apply? Like, all right, I'm going to start. I got my LLC. What are some things that they should be thinking about to have those building blocks? Yes. So there is a lot to entrepreneurship. And I think my journey into entrepreneurship was similar to a lot of others that, that I've heard over the years. Mm -hmm. And I went into entrepreneurship with a fair amount of confidence that I would be able to you know, build and grow because I think there's a lot of stuff in media that makes it almost sound you know, like entrepreneurship is easy. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you start going and you realize like how hard it is. And so what I recommend to people is that they start thinking about them building community. And it's actually, I, I wrote a whole chapter about it in the book. I, it, it, when, one wouldn't think of that community has something to do with value, but it mm -hmm. really does. And it's like the services that you provide and doing this podcast is a great example, but having community and people around you that can share insights and help you grow. And, mm -hmm. and thankfully for me, that took a number of forms, but one of the biggest things for me was I met a couple of entrepreneurs that were members of entrepreneurs organization mm -hmm. and went to an event of entrepreneurs organization or known as EO Minnesota. And mm -hmm. it, it was eye opening because I joined the organization and I went to an event on money and the speaker, you know, was kind of talking about all the things related to like money and finances. And of course, I had an air of confidence because that's my background is finance Mm -hmm. And I had this like, oh, no moment where I just realized like I am the stereotypical cobbler's kid that thinks they know everything and realizing I don't because I hated invoicing. I hated <laughs> accounting like I didn't like that stuff. And I was horrible at it. I was stinking up my own game because, of course, finance is looking forward and accounting is looking backwards. And that's when I realized the difference between the two. So there's a lot to learn in entrepreneurship, even if you think you're brilliant and you know, people or money or strategy or marketing or whatever, there's always something to learn and to sharpen the saw. So yeah. start as early as you can is what I recommend to people. Yeah, I love that you talk about community because I think a lot of business owners call themselves self-employed and that means you have a job. So changing that word to entrepreneur 
and going to organizations and having a community, you realize you're not in business by yourself. So I think changing that language, even if you do, are, you know, the own sole proprietor, right? So, or if you have a partner or whatever, but you need to, I think using those words and having that community and joining, joining communities like that, where you can have those epiphanies where you're like, oh yeah, <laughs> right? I really like that, Janet, it's spot on. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's kind of having your personal brand, which you did. You have a book, so you're developing a personal brand, which helps you develop community. Let's talk about cash flow. So, mm -hmm. and paying attention to your cash flow. What is your advice about cash flow for a business? Well, hopefully, people aren't listening to this at night, so it can help put them to sleep. No. <laughs> So cash flow is something that feels really complicated and scary to the vast majority of entrepreneurs, myself included, because people have gone through accounting, have seen and understand that, you know, there's the three pieces to financial statements, the P&L, the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. And cash flow is actually the hardest to calculate and it's the hardest to get your head around because it actually does not really align with the P&L, the financials of, of the income statement. And so in the book and what I've talked about with people is really helping to keep it super, super simple because what really matters is cash. Mm -hmm. And what I talk about is you have to think about this with the context of like your cash balance, but then there's what others owe you and what you owe to others. And I think it is really helpful to entrepreneurs to keep it that simple even when their business gets bigger and, and more complicated, mm -hmm. but boil it down to that. So that is something that they can always be thinking about because at the end of the day, what you want to have is your current cash, what others owe you and have that be greater than what you owe others. Because mm -hmm. by definition, then you've got a positive net worth. Your company should be somewhat fairly properly capitalized, but that is really key is to know where you stand on those three numbers at all times. And you don't have to get overly complicated on short-term, long-term debt and all that type of stuff, but boil it down to cash, what others owe you and what you owe others. I, love I like that. that, just keeping it simple. Yeah. Accounts receivable, accounts payable, and cash. Yeah. yeah. And I like when he puts I, it in those simpler terms. Yeah, you know? the simpler but, terms makes it sound better. And it's like, I, accounts right. receivable, what does that mean? But it's like, you know, what people owe me, yeah. everybody understands that. Exactly. That's what, you know, because that's where I struggled as a finance expert or whatever over the years mm -hmm. is, you know, you start to use those term with entrepreneurs and you see their eyes glaze over and rightfully so. The vast majority of entrepreneurs I know, like Mercedes, who founded uh, Mercury Mosaics and she makes these beautiful handmade custom tiles, mm -hmm. right? Mercedes is an artist. And she has made the the mosaics at Lululemon and some of the biggest art installations in the United States and beautiful work. This is what she thinks about. She does not think about AR. She has to and does now because she has a very sizable company, but that's not her language. And so mm -hmm. I think about Mercedes a lot, quite a bit, when I think about these things and how to get entrepreneurs comfortable with topics like cash flow and get them comfortable with uh, what they need to do to make sure their business uh, not only thrives, but survives along the way so they can ultimately thrive. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on, you know, raising capital or having, you know, maybe a line of credit or taking money out to grow your business? Because that can be scary. Sometimes you can get yourself in trouble. So how do you balance that? What's your advice on that? Yes, and in fundraising, capital raising is a big part of entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurs can bootstrap and build their businesses, but at some point, every business needs to tap into what I call external capital, money mm -hmm. outside of the business or money outside of what they can put in um, as the owner, people that are close to them. They have to have relationships with banks, other capital providers, other equity investors may be appropriate as well. And so the fundraising process is really about, and I love that we started with community, but it's really about making those one-on-one -on -one connections, whether it's their banker or an angel investor group or a venture capitalist or whatever that those groups and people may be. The mm -hmm. point is that they have to spend the time to go build those relationships. And as you were just alluding to, Melanie, 
the best time to be doing that is when you don't need it mm-hmm. and to start early. And that's what my dad used like, to say, borrow money when you don't need it. Exactly. So that's why, you know, as you, you, whenever you can pull, you know, establish a line of credit, either be, even if you don't need it at that point in time. Mm-hmm. But think about that early and start building those relationships. It's very important. Okay, Jen, I got another quick question on this okay. part here. So about, explain yeah. the difference of getting a line of credit versus using like your credit cards for a small business. People sometimes are, you know, they're using their credit cards to make, you know, regular payments or things that they have. And yeah. and then they get the credit card debt versus establishing a line of credit. So walk us through that. Yes. So all form of borrowing or debt will have a timeline associated with it and a cost to it and when it needs to be paid back. And credit cards are a great example of money that should be very short term, you know, 30 to 60 days. And you can extend it a little bit, but it's very expensive. A line of credit, a traditional line of credit from a bank is intended to be used for like six to 12 months, take it down, pay it back. And then you can get like a term loan, what which may for a business be five years. Where That's you're like paying a small business loan, like year. an SBA small, loan? Yep, oh. a small business loan. And then as you get into SBA loans, or you might even think about like the mortgage on your home, you can find products that could be 10, even 30 years out, like you'd get a mortgage on a home. And mm-hmm. so it's really important to think about the type of money that you need, but the timing of when it will get paid back. And, and Melanie, your question is so, so important because- What ends up happening, and I unfortunately see this all the time as an investor, is companies will tap into using credit cards to pay for things or their line of credit. And what's happening in the background is they make a hire. They they bring somebody on board and they're covering these other expenses to be able to, to pay this person in essence. So they're shuffling money around. That person that they're hiring, they're probably not gonna earn a return to that company bring in more revenue than what they're being paid for 12, you know, 12, 24 months out. And so all of a sudden they're taking short-term debt to be able to fund things like mm-hmm. new, like employees and so forth. And that's why, like in the book, I talk about capital matching. It's super important to think about where you're pulling money from and what it's being utilized for, because if that's mismatched, that's where all the problems happen. And so if somebody's bringing in employees and so forth, they want to think about longer term debt, like an SBA loan, or maybe bring in equity investors and so on and so forth, because the credit card debt in particular, as you pointed out, Melanie, it builds and it compounds. And then it's also tied into their, it's personally guaranteed by them and not by their business. Because even if a credit card's in the business name, it's tied to that individual and it can start to wreak havoc on people's personal lives. Mm-hmm. You this know, sounds so it. familiar. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what you're talking about? I'm, oh, so my first company with my former husband, we took out an SBA loan and then we hired someone and he that hire basically took most of that money from the SBA loan. Yep. And yeah, we never saw the return because it was another year or two before we... So I wish we would have listened to this podcast back then so we wouldn't have made that hire. <laughs> exactly. That's why we do this work. Well, yeah. at a good point, it reminds me of, you know, before that employee has a return on investment. So I think that's also a good point to make is you need to evaluate your employees and saying, am I getting a return? Are they doing the work that's helping my business? You know, whether it's someone who writes your newsletter or your blog post, are they being efficient and bringing because of their skill, they're bringing in business and it's helping us. But if they're not, then they need to be cut loose right? Because you're not getting the return on the investment for that employee. Exactly. And it's one of the hardest things for ever, any human being to do, you know, for entrepreneurs, you know, you know, hire somebody. And a lot of times when they're getting started, they're hiring people they know. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of times it's family. <laughs> and so, you know, if all of a sudden things aren't going well and you have to reduce their pay or let them go, uh-huh. that's one of the hardest things I see entrepreneurs have to face all the time. Uh-huh. But it's critical because- yeah. Look at the business needs to like build and to be able to grow and nobody's doing any favor to society or if people think about this within the context of impact, that company going belly up or somebody going bankrupt over this stuff, that's negative impact. Mm -hmm. So having to make those tough decisions of, you know, as some entrepreneurs will say, I love this. I, I can't remember who said this, but 
they'll release them to their next opportunity. But that's just <laughs> like the, that. the tough reality of business. And we all have to be prepared for that. Yeah, I agree. Well, you talk about in your book about asking the right questions, being curious. What are some of the top questions that we should be asking? Yes. So I learned this lesson when I, I had a career, a Wall Street career, where I would travel with CEOs and CFOs and go to Wall Street. And I saw an, a portfolio manager uh, one time, very sophisticated, ran billions of dollars, and sat down with the CEO and CFO of a public company and asked the simplest questions I'd ever heard. And as a young person, I would have been mortified to ask those types of questions because mm -hmm. it's like one of those things like, oh my gosh, you own literally tens of millions of dollars of stock in this company. You run billions of dollars. You've been doing this forever. And you're asking like really simple, you know, stupid questions in essence. And what I realized was those simple questions gave that portfolio manager more insights than he would have ever gotten asking more complicated questions. Mm -hmm. And I see this all the time with entrepreneurs. And so I think about like when I met Adele Starn, the founder and owner of Babies on Broadway, she did a wonderful job. When I first met her, she asked me questions of like, what do you do? How do you do it? Where do you get your money from? And I'll always remember that first meeting because I'm like, oh my gosh, Adele, like, you're brilliant because you probably, you know, a lot of times entrepreneurs will think like, I shouldn't ask those questions, but then there's entrepreneurs like Adele who aren't afraid to ask those types of questions and it empowers her because mm -hmm. when she's asking questions like that, she's able to get insights that she probably otherwise wouldn't because if she wanted to come into a meeting with a potential investor, a partner in her business and asking overly complicated questions, it would not have served her well because it would have missed out on the key things that really move the needle to help her and finding the partners for her business. So I encourage entrepreneurs to really think about questions of essence, asking simple questions and just being curious like a four-year-old. Don't be afraid to ask those questions because there's no such thing as dumb questions, especially for entrepreneurs, because you have to make sure you know and understand everything mm -hmm. so you don't get fleeced and snookered because I'm so sick of seeing that happen to entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I love that. Just keeping it simple, asking the simple questions and yep. being curious like a four-year-old. Like, yes. where do you get your funding? You know, asking a simple question. What exactly do you do? Like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, because the only time I've seen people hurt is when they make an assumption. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, and you see it, unfortunately, we see it quite a bit with like these online lenders and some of these fintechs that kind of have a fancy UX, UI, user experience, user interface on their website and stuff like that. And they promise, you know, low rates and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, those are the things that can get really ugly for entrepreneurs quick if they're not careful. What are some of the things that we should be doing to make our business attractive to sell? Ah, that is awfully a fun, that's a fun question. So I like to think about it as the things that people do to just help make sure that the business is valuable, which is really tied into preparing for a sale. So then an entrepreneur, that founder, those shareholders in that business, if an opportunity comes about where they can sell the business, they're prepared and ready to do that. But for for others, it may be important to just have their ducks in a row because then they know the value of their business when it comes to issuing stock options or if they want to sell stock to, to, to shareholders to raise money or whatever the case may be. So the things that are really important is to make sure you know processes are documented, that there's an understanding of what the business is worth mm -hmm. is very important, is to make sure that there's redundancies in the business to make sure it's not over-reliant on any one person or group of people. So that's where I know on your podcast, you've talked about this before with your guests. You're thinking about like, how do you like um, be able to elevate and become an owner and not an employee? Mm -hmm. So you, you have other people that can do key functions in that business. Mm -hmm. Because here's the thing, you know, we could go on for a huge list of what these are. And actually, I would encourage people to go to ChatGPT. It'll spit out a nice list of things that you need to like prepare. But at the end of the day, the entrepreneur can think about this simply as 
if this business or when this business is somebody else's hands, what do they need to have and to feel like they've got an asset that can be extremely valuable to them over time? Because mm -hmm. that is also the key to how that entrepreneur can get the most value for their business today is if that business in a new owner's hands can really grow and to build. And so if mm -hmm. they've got something that is replicable, has good processes, has a great market, so on and so forth, that's what's going to move the needle. I love that. There's so many great insights you have from just you talking and also your book, The Breakout Valuation. Where can people go to find you to get more information if they have more questions? Sure. So the website is breakoutvaluation.com. And I welcome all communications with people it is patrick at breakoutvaluation.com. So people can email me and we'll get back in touch and, and so forth, but happy to share insights. I'm also, you can find the links right on the website, but to LinkedIn and so forth. But I love to communicate with people. I help people wherever possible. So Patrick at breakoutvaluation.com is an easy way to get in touch. Thanks, Patrick. It was so great. Uh, I got a bunch of notes here. Really super helpful. It was awesome. Yeah, thank so, you, Melody. Thank you, Jen. Yep, make sure you go grab his book. And, and if you're thinking about becoming an author, remember we make all of our authors number one bestsellers and we help you go from blank page to a full book that will work for your business. Reach out to us at EliteOnlinePublishing.com and hit the author submission button. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Hey, are you looking to increase your revenue, build credibility and elevate your brand? This podcast is brought to you by Elite Online Publishing an innovative publishing and full spectrum marketing company. They will publish and market your book to make it a number one bestseller. Becoming an author is the best way to market your business. So contact them at eliteonlinepublishing.com today. All of their authors become number one bestsellers.